Uh, my name is Lisa Shea. I'm with the Blackstone Valley Art Association. A number of people here are with the Blackstone Valley Art Association. Bob Evans is our vice president. Carol Frieswick is our treasurer. Uh, Dennis is, oh, I've forgotten. Oh, he's on the board member. He's a board member now from sunny Florida. So welcome everyone and thank you for participating in the show. We had a great selection. We had nearly a hundred entries, which is wonderful. The video is up on YouTube and Facebook. So everyone's hopefully had a chance to see that. And Matt is our judge. So I'll let Matt talk about his thoughts on the judging process and then anything else he wants to discuss about photography. We are his for the evening. <laughs> Okay, great. Yeah, thanks for everyone for joining. Uh, you know, it's a real honor and a privilege to, to be asked to be the judge of this ninth annual Anything Goes show. Um, I thought to, you know, it was, it was a competitive field. It was difficult to, you know, make some decisions, but, uh, you know, it was, it was, you know, again, it was a lot of really enjoyable experience. Um, there were a few categories that were really, you know, really competitive. Um, and I think this year, you know, has brought out, it's a great year, you know, as terrible as it's been, it's been a great year to kind of learn photography and learn more about editing and, and everything like that and take advantage of, of the downtime we all have. Um, and, and also get out there and photograph locally, at least, uh, since we can't do much traveling right now. But um, now let me uh, go in. So, so one of the first things I did was, was really culling the images uh, down from, from the beginning. And that's something I do you know, every time I go out and shoot, I come back to the computer and I'm sure you all do that. Call down the photos to, you know, mark ones that you like more than others and, and just kind of continually call down the process. So that was kind of my starting point. And so when I uh, came in here, I started initially with, sorry. Uh, first, I took everything down to about 25 photos. I don't have those, but I, I We'll share here with you when I called it down again I called it down to 15. So these were the uh, top 15 images in my mind um, that I was able to separate uh, out from the show. Um, you know and a lot of it just came down to visual interest. You know at first I often looked at the photo in a small small thumbnails and then gradually kind of looked at them larger and larger. Uh, once I got down to maybe 25 I, I really started looking at the images more closely and then it was just a continual process from that point. Um, so that, that was the, the top 15 that I had had selected and all those I, you know, really reviewed carefully. Um, and then these were the six um, images that that placed and these are in no particular order right now on my screen. So don't uh, go ahead and <laughs> um, these were just the submission numbers that that had come up. Uh, so these were the six images that that I placed as uh, as winning images. And I'll talk about each one here as I go in and can open up each one separately. Um, so I don't, I don't know if I'll start from, from the bottom, I guess, here. Uh, so this was honorable uh, mention three. Uh, this was an image by Wendy. Uh, beautiful uh, macro close up here of a, of a butterfly on, on a flower. Uh, the bokeh uh, blur background is just gorgeous and the colors are really complementary. I really thought this was a you know a beautiful piece. Um, kind of instantly catches your eye when you first look at it. Uh, I place this as honorable mention three. It was a tough decision. There was a lot of powerful uh, wildlife photos in particular in this competition. Um, and if I got hypercritical, which I hate to do, um, the focus plane when you're you know so so tight on something and shooting at such a a small, you know, a wide open aperture um, in order to get that nice blurred background is, is the caveat to that is, is you lose some of the focus. So the focus plane is perfect right on the uh, butterfly's eyeball and right on the right where you want it to be. Um, but in a perfect world, it'd be nice if a little more of the butterfly's feathers were, were more in focus. They're a little soft. Um, so while it was well, a fantastic image, I'm really happy with it. It is, you know, one of the honorable mentions for that reason. Um, that's just what kind of separated it from, from the rest. If the butterfly was a little sharper uh, on the wings, um, would be even stronger placing image. Um, honorable mention two uh, was submitted by Jeff. Um, and, and this is a, just a beautifully framed perfect like New England winter, you know, just, just speaks to me on a lot of levels. 
uh, grist mill kind of traditional New England look and freshly fallen snow. The pop of the red and the white, uh, you know, instantly catches my eye. This is when I when I first was looking through them, especially at a smaller size. This was one that I instantly targeted and said, you know, this is going to be one of the placement images. Um, I really love the way it's framed with the trees kind of perfectly framing the house. So there's there's a, a lot to love about this. The freshly fallen snow, there's not a footprint or anything. So obviously I think Jeff was out there right after the snow fell or early morning um, to be able to capture a scene like this. Um, the, again, the red and the white is just such a beautiful color contrast. It reminded me a lot of seeing like a red cardinal out in, in on a tree in the, in the winter. Um, some of the things are, are that I, you know, again, critically looking at this and I, and I, you know, I know everyone takes their artwork personally. Um, so again, this is trying to be just constructive criticism and um, hopefully no, no offense intended. Uh, I thought the, the micro contrast or the clarity was, was processed a little too strongly in this, uh, especially if this were, you know, if I were doing this, I would want to apply that selectively where it looks like it's been applied on a global level throughout the entire photo. Um, where if you were to just selectively brush that in, in any, you know, editing program on the rocks in the house, for example, but leave that off the, the snow and the branches, um, I really feel that would make it a stronger image. I thought it was just a little too highly textured, like really high on the clarity. Um, could be something that a program like Photomatics HDR kind of brings out. Um, and again, I think that can be good in certain places, but it often doesn't work globally in my opinion. Um, so that was one of the things that, that you know, I, I saw about this that I thought, you know, with a different, with some editing, it could be even stronger, even though it is an extremely strong image. Um, I also thought the red is a little too, a little too enhanced, um, the red color, whether that's a U uh, issue or, or saturation, uh, it just looked like it was pumped up a little too much. It, it's important for the red to pop and really catch your eye, but, but I thought it, it was bordering on unnatural uh, in terms of the red color. So um, those were the, the, you know, critical comments about it. Again, the, the framing, um, the just scene itself, the you know, the timing of being there at the right place at the right time, making the effort uh, clearly shows through here. And it is a you know, beautiful winter New England image uh, with the grist mill. Um, honorable mention uh, number one goes to um, this submission here. This was by Mike, uh, Mike Blake. Uh, I don't know exactly where this is, but it definitely is somewhere out west, sort of some abandoned um, ghost town kind of uh, kind of look. I just thought it was a really cool subject. Um, in addition to being a really cool subject, I thought the composition was excellent and just the scene brought out, it wasn't just one house or one abandoned car, but you had your, you know, the, the car framed up nicely, leading lines going right into the house. And then you have rows of more houses in the background, which really, really complemented it nice. I thought the black and white lurk really well here. The powerful clouds really make the image pop. So I really thought that was uh, excellent choice of black and white where you get those clouds kind of popping and the big white puffy clouds, dramatic look with the abandoned houses. A lot of nice texture applied to the house uh, where you can really kind of see the, the you know, wood uh, that this was all made out of. Really thought it was a powerful image. Um, again, the critical aspects looking at it that way um, I thought the lighting was a little harsh. Uh, you know, it was probably, uh, you know, time, you know, maybe a little earlier, a little later in the day, might've been a little softer light. Some of the lighting comes off a little harsh on it. I thought the some of the sharpening was, uh, I thought could have been left out of the sky. So I thought everything was sharpened nicely in the foreground, a lot of detail on the car, a lot of detail on the house, uh, on that wood in the house that really needed that sharpening, really took advantage of that. Uh, but the sharpening is present in the clouds, which, which I think it really should have been toned back in the clouds. So again, that's something that instead of applying something globally, it could be selectively done um, in terms of selectively sharp, taking that out of the clouds, but applying the sharpening elsewhere. Um, but a powerful image nonetheless, a uh, really interesting subject. Um, and I thought a fascinating photo. Um, all right, sorry. Um, this, this was place number three. Uh, this, uh, is a submission by Bob Evans, Wave Down. Um, 
And it, you know, at first glance, depending on what, if you're into kind of this genre or not of photography, it may or may not catch your eye, but the more you look at it, the more I started to really appreciate this image and really appreciate how the photographer has gone out of his way or his or her way um, to make this, you know, abandoned scale uh, really be the subject. You know, you can see the lighting just kind of subtly dappled coming in through, you know, likely a window on the side. This may have been taken, you know, it's hard to say, it may have been a night photograph with a long exposure uh, to get that kind of nice soft lighting coming in from the side. Uh, it could have been daytime and, and light coming in through the window. Um, but I just thought it was really, uh, you know, just powerful, really well done. And just the subtlety of it, the detail, again, some of the other images that were the honorable mention, I had mentioned some what I thought was, you know, either over sharpening or bringing out too much detail in certain areas. You know, this photo clearly has a lot of detail added and um, sharpening, but you you don't notice it. It's not, it, it more brings attention where you want to look. So it's really drawing the viewer's eye. Uh, I can tell the photographer put a lot of time and effort into uh, how they plan this out, really framed everything nicely. Um, it really just an interesting subject, you know, why is this uh, abandoned, you know, I'm not sure what this is, abandoned truck scale or something, or some sort of uh, farm uh, equipment scale, uh, you know, in this abandoned warehouse, and, you know, why is the wall so colorful, I man, the colors are, are fantastic, and, you know, why does this have all this layers of paint, are those, you know, just decades of different paint changes, is that some graffiti, you know, just really kind of brings out a lot of questions, and, and you know, and that's as, as I'm thinking, you know, the photographer had that in their mind. They saw this and really have made an interesting subject about something that a lot of people would just walk right past. Um, and that's what I thought was really quite fascinating about this image. And that's why I placed this as, uh, as number three. Uh, number two was uh, Nancy Wright's uh, image of this snowy owl in flight, uh, which is just an incredible capture. Uh, you know, the to me, what stood out the most is, I mean, instantly when you see it, you're, you're kind of wow kind of image, obviously. Um, but you know, what stood out to me is just the difficulty of capturing the owl perfectly in flight headed right towards the photographer with both their eyes, uh, looking directly at the photographer, the focus is perfect. Um, you know, this is the kind of shot that takes a thousand images, you know, a thousand clicks of the shutter when you're out there doing wildlife photography to, to nail. Um, so really a lot of effort is obviously went into this, um, you know, beautiful capture, really powerful, um, you know, really looking at it. And this was definitely a contender for, for number one. And I really went back and forth a lot on this. And originally when I looked at it, this was number one for me. Um, really when I started viewing the images and I'll get into that more when I do show you number one and, and explain that process. When I really started getting in, in the images and looking at them, you know, at, at full screen, 100% on my screen, you know, I, this image compared to the um, other image, I can see on this image, I think what is a slight overexposure on, you know, on the owl's head, which the artist, uh, you know, properly toned down by reducing highlights or, you know, other things in Lightroom and made that much improved, but you still, there's still some detail lost that otherwise could have been present in, you know, in the top of the owl's head and some in the top of the wings. Um, so I just think compared to, uh, you know, a, a perfect first place image um, that would probably have retained that detail there. So it's, it's really subtle, but you know, when you're talking between a first and second place image that, that can kind of be a differentiator, um, but a beautiful capture, you know, the, the capturing an animal like that, that's that fast in flight is not an easy thing. And to have it just coming directly at the photographer with the eyes, I, I thought it was really powerful. Um, pleasing background. So, so that was a very strong, strong image in my mind. Uh, so, so what I was saying, I mean, the obvious, there's a lot of beauty in this shot um, and a lot of it's obvious at first glance, but the more you really kind of open this and, and you know, and that, and that can partially be because it is a panoramic, um, you know, and a lot of times you're looking at it and you're, you're not seeing it as wide. So it really is an image that, that really looks more and more beautiful the more, more you look it up at a, a wide view. Um, so, uh, you know, I know, I know where this location is. I've, I've been to this exact uh, church location. I can't remember the town, but I know it's in New Hampshire. Um, and I remember this church with the, with the field in front. 
Um, so, I, so I've been there before. So I know certain aspects about it. Like, for example, I know that there's a road kind of in front of the church you can't see because a photographer right here, here made, I think, an excellent choice of using a, a long telephoto type lens to really compress uh, the scene and bring that church look uh, you know, closer to you. And really that compression helps with these foliage shots because it brings those layers of you know, hills and, and trees up on the mountain and it brings them all together. So it really compresses all that view in, in the background versus a, a wide angle, for example, of this scene would look completely different. Um, and so I thought it was an excellent choice here of a, of a long, long lens um, to, to do that telephoto lens. Uh, but also what I was saying, and I know this is a road, I know there's uh, telephone lines that go right across this scene in, in person, because <laughs> I've seen it myself. Um, and so uh, some people may, you know, some purists that I think would, would maybe take offense to removing things like lines and, and things like that. Personally, personally, I don't. I mean, if you were replacing um, something and putting something that wasn't there, I, I would obviously have an issue with that. Um, but if you're kind of just cleaning up what is a visual distraction without taking away from the scene, um, I think that was a, a smart choice by the photographer here. But more in, of my point is I've zoomed in on this 100%. I can't see any imperfection at all. I, you know, they've, they've made a perfect cleanup job in terms of any distractions. I really think the house is the subject here. They've done a great job of really just bringing out the detail um, you know, on that house, really bringing your eyes to it. I like the way a lot of times is, you know, I would classify this as more of a landscape image. And a lot of times on a landscape image, you want that to be in focus front to back, uh, you know, and that's said often. Uh, but in this case, I, I think the photographer made a really creative decision that worked excellently of having that foreground of some of that wheat uh, in the foreground or those wheat flowers. Um, out of focus, really kind of just blurs the screen, really nice, just makes a nice entry into the photograph, into the church scene. Um, th these are not beautiful wildflowers. So I think if these were perfectly in focus and you had focus front to back, maybe use focus stacking or some technique to do that, I, I think it would actually be a weaker image because you would have a less pleasing uh, foreground. But in this case, I think you have a really nice, pleasing blurred foreground that just leads you into the photograph. Um, so there's a lot here. They really filled the frame with color. Um, it left out the sky. And in this case, it, it just works perfectly. Um, you get that beautiful autumn color. Um, you know, autumn is, it, it changes every year when it's going to be peak. And they really captured this right at the peak. So there's only a, you know, a few days a year that an image like this could be captured this well. Um, you go a few, a, couple days later and half those leaves in the background are, are on the ground and it doesn't look as good. Um, so they really caught this, I think, at peak foliage time um, and, and just thought just a wonderful composition, great color contrast, really powerful image. And again, perfectly edited, uh, you know, and, and sort of perfectly taken, uh, both in terms of the execution and planning, um, as well as the, the final result. Uh, there's, there's not a flaw to be, to be found on this uh, and, it's, and a beautiful image. Um, and uh, that's why I chose this as number one. And again, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't an easy decision. It was a one one that I really went back and forth on um, because originally I, you know, but the more and more I looked at this, the more, the more it was the most powerful image to me within the set. Um, so I, I thank you. For your, for your time and hearing me talk. I, I don't, hope I haven't bored you all. I'll um, leave it, go back to, to Lisa and see if anyone has any comments or wants me to talk about other things or um, really anything open for anything. Well, first, uh, congratulations to the winners for uh, their great works. They are very pretty. And Carol Frieswick is our treasurer, so she'll be getting in contact with you guys to send you your checks. Because when we do these, we bring in money for the entry fees, and then we put it all back out again as prizes plus a stipend for Matt. So everything goes back out again. So you guys will each get checks to celebrate your winnings with. Does anyone have any questions for Matt about the way he judged or anything about their pictures? I would like to say thank you. Thank you, Wendy. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate it. Was it was an honor. Yeah, I really, really, you know, appreciated the, the entries and everyone's, everyone's interest. And it's wonderful to have you all here, um, allowing me to discuss what I went through. And, uh, you know, um, 
I, I was impressed with the entries and it was uh, some very difficult decisions. Thank you again, I appreciate it. And I appreciate your critical comments because that's how you learn and get better. Yeah, you know, it can be hard. Some people take, uh, you know, creative criticism different than others, uh, you know, and especially now in this social media society where, uh, you know, I remember a few years back using, um, you know, photography forums and things where critical comments were, were commonplace and you kind of had to, you know, get a tough skin and, and hopefully learn from it. Um, and it's mm -hmm. kind of changed recently with the social media, it just becomes everything. So everything's wonderful, you know, and no one can, can say anything negative. So, so yeah, truly, I hope I didn't, you know, say anything uh, harmful to the people that place. These were the placed images. Uh, you know, I, I tend to look at everything with a perfectionist eye. I think a lot of uh, photographers and artists tend to, you know, strive for perfection and, and really seek out the little details. Um, and again, the, the things I brought up were minor. These were, you know, these were powerful images. They were all placed images. Um, but, you know, uh, I just brought out some things that, that can make a difference between a, a second place image, a third place image, a fourth place image, and so on. Hey, Mass, it's uh, Bob Evans here. Thanks. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. So I just have a question. So uh, again, I thank you again for the judging. I found it a very um, um, appropriate, and I really, I really like your insights into it. Question I have is that for the top three, and you know, thank you again you know, for my place you know, as third. I really appreciate that. But all three of them, you know, my, my own's included, the subject was slap bang in the center which, you know, you know, you read online and, you know, you talk to people and everyone talks about, you know, the rule of thirds or doing things, you know, reading lines in and out, et cetera, et cetera. And I was just intrigued as to why all three of them, you know, had the subject in the center and uh, why you thought having the subject in the center was um, okay in your perspective. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. Uh, and, you know, and there are a lot of these, you know, so-called rules. And, and I think it's, it's very important to, to learn them in the beginning, you know, to, to learn the proper rules, the, you know, the rules of thirds and, and, you know, and a lot of it is, I, I think in, in a way, a lot of it more pertains to portrait photography. There are certain rules you, you definitely would want to keep when it comes to portrait photography. You don't want to make certain crops, uh, you know, a, a cropping off limbs at certain places and having the eyes and the, and the proper, you know, parallel third. Uh, is always helps with with portrait photography and a lot of that has been brought into landscape photography and other things and and don't center them and you know don't have your horizon right in the center um, and I think that it is important to know those rules in the beginning to learn what they are see why you do it and a lot of times the horizon one is the true one but there's always allow it you know allowance for breaking those rules um, and once you start to learn them and know what they are I think you can break them. And if you break them, you know, in this case, for a reason, uh, you know, it doesn't make a less powerful image. And there's no reason why you can't have your landscape photographer, you know, photography main subject right in the center. Um, you can have the horizon right in the middle if it's a reflection shot, for example. You know, if a photo has a, a beautiful reflection, it's going to look much better if you leave that right in the center, even though the rule states, you know, don't ever have your horizon in the center. Um, so, so there are a lot of unwritten photography rules, if you will, that, that I think should be, should be learned and knowledgeable about. Um, but then once you kind of get the hang of it and, and start going on your own, I think you can break those rules. And, I, you know, I didn't even honestly analyze them that way to say, oh, these are all, you know, these are centered images or the image was in the center. It just worked for me uh, in, every, in every case of the, of the three images where the subject was in the center. Um, but it, it didn't really, I didn't look at that as being a negative and I, I thought that was a creative decision by the photographer that made sense for the photograph. So I ho hope that I, answers my, my thought process on it. Yeah, it did. I mean, I mean thank you so much. I, yeah, for myself, you know, the one with the scale, I mean, it, it just suited me. I wanted it in the center because it was absolutely yeah, the center point of the whole, the whole presentation, you know, and particularly getting the lights running from left to right. And I, I took it, many ways, but uh, in the end, you know, that particular way, I think it you know, worked. It's how I saw it. And uh, I really appreciate that you liked it as well. So that's great. So thank you very much. Yeah. Sure, yeah, yeah, thanks Bob. Yeah, I mean, really on that on that image, it is the light that, that drew me in, you know, that, that subtle light is kind of 
made a scale into the obvious subject of this photograph. You know, it was obvious the, photo, the photographer's intention, you know, and from the, the work in camera and also in post, you could, you could tell their intention. And that, that uh, just came across a very professionally done image uh, for that reason. So that could have been a, a person there getting the light on them, or in this case, it was, you know, it was an abandoned scale, um, but uh, it worked. Thanks, and again, it, it was in the daytime, it was a cloudy day, and there was a, a broken window on the left, which I'd actually okay. climbed to get into the factory. So. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. <laughs> we won't tell anyone. That's not that. Anyone else have any questions for Matt? Hey, this is Linda Grant. I just wanted to say thank you to Matt for taking the time to go through the pictures. I appreciate it. I, I loved all of your comments. Um, I honestly thought that the snowy owl would win, to be honest, but <laughs> um, I, I really appreciate it. I loved all of your, your critiques and Bob, your image was amazing as well. Um, I love the scale. That was another one of my favorites. So thank you so much to everybody. I appreciate it. Thank you, Linda. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if anyone wants to see the top 15 again or or me talk about my photography or show photography, whatever, you know, whatever the audience would like. Well, someone had a question about um, light in photography because okay. uh, we, we talk a lot about composition in photography, but she wanted to hear more about the use of light in photography. And the picture of yours that I always think of is that beautiful cliffside one that has like the fences right along the cliff and the clouds drifting past it. Sure, sure. So I thought maybe if you could talk about that and whatever other pictures you wanted to talk about. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, for for me, me, I mean, light is kind of my my thing, if you will. You know, that's kind of where I, uh, it's what I look for uh, is interesting light. You know, typically on a landscape or or nature scene, or it really could be you know could be a cityscape, could be anything. But um, I'm really looking for powerful or interesting light. Um, so that's really what kind of draws my eye more than more than anything. Um, I, I often lately, I'm, I, I don't, I don't really like to say this because it's not a positive thing, but I've been kind of a light snob lately where, you know, if the light's not right, or if I don't think the lighting's perfect, I'll, I'll go somewhere and I'll, I'll keep my phone out and take pictures of my phone, but I don't even take the camera out. Um, and I, you know, kind of will scout out a scene for the future, but with intention of coming back there when I think the lighting is better. Um, so the lighting to me is, is just really powerful just because it completely transforms the scene but so it, it, these are some of, you know are some of my you know favorite images or at least I, I kind of broke these out into different different categories these particular images but but again light is, is a dominant um, feature on here I typically like side lighting when lighting is coming in uh, from a side so uh, the mountain image you were describing is, is kind of right here at the top. Uh, the top middle and these are square crops of everything so that you're not really seeing the full photo here and I can try to get into them. Um, but these are, are you know, all, every one of these really have examples of, of interesting light, uh, again, often coming in from the side. So this uh, first one of these uh, cabins here in this winter mountain scene, the light, the sunrise was coming up uh, from this direction right into here, kind of shining on the scene. Um, and that's usually what I try to look for is that side light. Um, so again, on this mountain scene, this was another sunrise photo. Um, so the light was coming up on the, on the front angle here. Really the most dramatic thing about this photo is, is the cloud movement that I was just extremely fortunate to capture as I was up on this uh, mountaintop, the clouds are just moving super fast coming in from my left over here, uh, coming this way and then just kind of sweeped across but didn't completely cover the mountain for that particular moment. Uh, and then shortly after the mountain peaks were completely obscured the rest of the morning. Um, but I had nice dappled light coming in again from, from this side. Uh, this is more of a straight on sunburst, but again, there is some you know interesting light, a lot of light kind of dappling onto the tree uh, which is the focus here and onto the grass in the front and, and the leaves. So, um, and, and the nice uh, starburst as it was kind of obstructed by, by a lot of the, by the leaf and, and the tree. So it wasn't, if a lot of these leaves weren't here, I couldn't have taken this photo. So you needed just a little bit of exposed uh, area for that sun to shine through for that, for that to come through like that. Um, again, interesting light, uh, just an amazing sunset. Um, 
that I was fortunate enough to see this summer in uh, Newport here. Um, and I just had an amazing sky, almost, you know, almost unbelievably nice uh, in terms of almost looks artificial to me, but it, but it really did look like that um, as the uh, sun was setting in this case. This was another sunrise. So I do a lot of sunrise uh, photography. This was on a beach on the Cape. Um, and I was kind of waiting on this uh, cliff edge here for the sun to come up. Um, sun just kind of gave a nice glow to the scene and directional light here on, uh, on the grasses and sand in front, which is a little hard to see at this square crop. Um, uh, this was a shot uh, kind of in the desert in Arizona in a place called The Wave, uh, where it, was, it isn't usually water in the desert, so I was lucky to capture it right after a rainfall and there was a nice puddle here. So I just set my camera really low and caught uh, the puddle reflection of this uh, unique sandstone mountain. Um, and the light was, it was, this was already late morning or at least probably around 10 o'clock. Um, but the light was shining uh, or the sunlight was kind of obstructed by this um, wall, if you will. And so it was kind of coming in from, from here, which just kind of gave a nice, nice glow coming in again from the side. Um, an aurora image, uh, sunrise here um, in Paris, where I had a nice, beautiful sunrise coming again, kind of from the side. Um, this is a local Massachusetts, uh, not far from um, your, your area there, uh, the Old Stone Church, um, where this was a sunset image and the sun was setting again over here. Uh, so again, usually I try to look for that kind of scene where the sun is either rising or setting uh, to the left or to the right of my of my composition. Um, these are recent images, so I, I released, you know, either recently taken or just recently processed. So I, I figured I would just go through those. They're kind of fresh on my mind. Um, so not necessarily my favorite or best images, but the most recent images I worked on. And you know, I like to think I am slowly improving over time. So. Uh, you know, as I, there's constant evolution and there's constant learning when, with photography and with photography editing, there's always something, you know, new to learn, new techniques to try either in the field or in post. Um, so I think it's something that you're kind of always striving. You can never be perfect. You know, you're always kind of trying to get better and better and improve um, more and more. So these are my most recent examples. So I, 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 I'm pleased with these, uh, but they're not necessarily my, my favorite images. Uh, but this was uh, just, I thought, a beautiful kind of lake. This was uh, actually just as sunrise was coming up. So the sun was just barely on the horizon at this point. Uh, still kind of had that blue hour look. Uh, had taken a photo of the same location, kind of from the more typical uh, overlook of this town. Um, at before sunrise is kind of a blue hour. And this was just a little bit later. I went, went down to the waterfront and was able to get some kind of nice reflection. Um, there was some nice fog coming in on the left side here. There's a little low cloud kind of fog bank. Um, but really these timber houses were what caught my eye here. Just the really wonderfully textured and colored houses built right up on the, on the cliff side, um, kind of formed nice nice angles when it comes to photography. You know, either like to have leading lines or angles a lot. So this, I just thought formed a really nice triangle from here to here. Uh, have some light coming in the side. It's subtle, but you can see kind of light hitting, uh, you know, in certain places here. If you look closely, there's, there's some uh, sunlight coming in from those angles. That's really what caught my eye on there. A um, little bit longer focal length. I, a, lot of, a lot of times we'll use a wide angle, uh, but this was more around 75, I think. Uh, for the focal length um, to, again, kind of compress the houses, but also bring this mountain in the back even closer um, to, to where the houses were. Um, this was uh, taken in uh, Westerly, Rhode Island. Um, took this uh, around the end of the summer. Uh, fortunately, with the pandemic, there wasn't, there wasn't people there. Otherwise, there would be. Um, but this is a beautiful beach in, um, in Westerly, Rhode Island, uh, not too far away. Uh, and, and again, here the sun was setting uh, just over here, so just kind of right off my, right out of my, uh, of my screen, right to the right. So I had some nice side light coming, coming right in, highlighting these grasses uh, over here, highlighting the fence post, um, and highlighting this uh, sand bank and grasses over here. Uh, and that's obviously what caught my eye. The fence I thought was a great leading line into the photo, so it kind of starts on the edge of the frame and brings you kind of around and through uh, the photo. And this just natural curve of this beach is kind of horseshoe shape. Um, but really thought that it should kind of led the viewer in, um, in terms of composition. 
why I chose this as well as the path here in front. Um, but again, it's that, it's that interesting side light that, that is really what I look for um, personally. Um, this was a sunrise uh, taken uh, just this, uh, this winter, uh, just a, a month or so ago uh, in uh, Beverly, Massachusetts. Um, and uh, sun, uh, the sun actually hadn't quite risen yet. Um, and I want to recall it was rising either, I think it was going to rise right here, but it hadn't quite risen yet. It was kind of just right before sunrise, but, but a colorful clouds in the sky, long exposure here. Um, I really like the, you know, the motion of the water. Um, I do a lot of waterscapes, I haven't talked about that, but um, with the water, I usually try to catch the water when it's receding rather than coming in. So kind of wait for it to come in and then recede. Um, and really shutter speed is important when you're uh, photographing water, it can completely change everything. If you're 30 second exposure or one second exposure or you know, one 250th of a second exposure, you're gonna have three completely different looks. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I really do like seascape photography and trying to capture waves is because no two ever look the same and you can go to the same place and you'll get a different photo every time. Um, this was about that one second uh, exposure time, which is usually my uh, sweet spot, if you will, usually around uh, anywhere from a uh, half second to two seconds, I would say, is kind of the sweet spot for capturing water motion, where you get some motion, but you also get some really cool effects as it recedes out. You get some nice lines. Um, and uh, again, the light is coming in really just from one side. The other side is dark. Uh, this wasn't directional light exactly because the sun hadn't risen yet, but just the lighting in the sky. Um, right, so this is back to that same scene. So this is what I talked about before, where this was before the sun uh, had risen. Um, there was actually the moon um, still still out in the sky. Uh, just as amazing, cloud bank was was just what was unique here. So this doesn't have interesting light necessarily, um, but just a beautiful kind of blue hour scene, perfectly still uh, water here, so I could get this great reflection uh, on the lake. Um, and this is a little further back from, from where I showed that other photograph where I kind of walked up to about here, I think, to take that other photo uh, that I had shown uh, to the water's edge looking that way. Um, this is similar to the other um, photo I had shown of, the, uh, of this uh, Japanese maple tree. Uh, this was another photo that I, I had and I just recently worked on. I hadn't, uh, I just processed the one and a lot of times I'll go to a location and take a lot of photos and I'll just pick one and stick with it. Um, but this tree I like so much, I decided I wanted to give it another go with some other photos from, uh, from that location shot. Um, and I thought just the shadows uh, of the light coming in were what really uh, made this photo. Um, you can really see the directional light here, you know, coming in and just streaming through, really lightening up the foliage and hitting the tree at certain angles. Uh, and then here on the grass, really kind of hitting the grass, uh, you know, in certain places, as well as the trees shadow um, coming here on the grasses. Obviously the foliage color, just an incredible specimen, this uh, Japanese maple tree. Uh, uh, again, just an interesting light shot right in the center again, uh, <laughs> Bible knows. Uh, but this was just a powerful oak tree that I saw this sort of sunset. Um, this was just over the Massachusetts border in New Hampshire um, of this oak tree that I had just seen um, in, a, in a nice pretty field um, that he took uh, uh, over the summer. Um, and I just thought the uh, Thought I just captured the scene nice and well, so I went there. I went to it for kind of scouted it out, and then came back at at sunset. Um, this is a long exposure shot. I was pretty far back in this field, uh, shooting around 200 millimeters, I think, um, at the time when I shot this, uh, just to kind of compress that field of grass um, and bring it in. Um, uh, a couple is probably two in a row here of a uh, waterfall shot from uh, Granby, Connecticut. Um, this is a, a beautiful park uh, right in Connecticut that has some powerful waterfalls and uh, went there this fall during uh, peak foliage time. Um, and uh, I, again, this is another time when shutter speed really, you know, has an effect on, on how this water looks where you're really capturing the motion. So you're getting some of that silky look, which I like, but I often don't like it to be 100% silky smooth uh, that you might get with like a 30 second exposure. 
Um, so this is most likely, I think a two to four second exposure, I would say maybe two second um, to catch that, that kind of motion. Um, I just like the leading lines in this, how everything kind of flows down. Um, and, and this is another example too, the same, same water volume, just further, I kind of ventured down a little bit lower and took a vertical composition where again, I kind of had everything coming off and I saw this rock kind of falling, you know, looks like it's about to fall, even though it's been there probably for 50 years, um, you know, right on, right on the water's edge where the water kind of leads your, leads your eyes. Um, and this is the stone church, uh, in, um, uh, West Boylston, Mass. Um, I just had, you know, beautiful reflection sunset. I think we, I, think I showed that photo before. So anyway, I, I'll, I think you've probably seen enough of my photography, but uh, so I'll, I'll go back, but see if I can get back to the meeting here. So anyway, uh, if anyone has any questions, oh, uh, I see one here. Okay, so um, how often do I use filters? Uh, that, that's a great question. Um, I, I use filters uh, very often. Um, I, I often will use, um, I don't use graduated filters. Uh, I use uh, ND filters, uh, so completely solid ND filters. Um, and then I will often uh, exposure bracket rather than graduated filters, because I, I don't like the effect with a graduated filter that if anything's above the horizon, it's going to stay darker. So you'll want that sky darker, but it will darken up any mountaintop sticking out or any trees or something. Um, so I usually don't like that effect. So I, I try to just use a solid, Filters, I use screw on filters. Um, breakthrough photography are, is my uh, brand of preference. Uh, I've used other filters in the past. It's not that their filters are so superior, it's they're constructed in a way that you can use them for years and they always work. Um, so you don't have, you know, it doesn't get stuck on the lens or, you know, it's not. Uh, so they're using just the top quality brass, really nice grips. You can use them in the freezing cold. Um, so that's why they're really my, my chosen brand. They, they clean really easily, don't, don't get uh, you know, water and dust on them as much as other brands. Um, so, but I do use ND filters a lot to try to control the way I want the scene to look. Um, you know, again, it's something I'll look at in camera and, and tweak, or, and I'll take photos with and without filters of the ND variety. And I also use polarizer filters. Um, so if I'm, going, if I'm gonna shoot anything foliage related, I am always gonna have a polarizer. Um, on my lens. Um, and so I have, uh, I use screw on filters. I have some step up rings as well. So I have a couple sets of filters that will work on all my different lenses. Uh, so I can put a polarizer on any one of my lenses. Um, and, and again, so ND filters I use quite often, uh, maybe 25% of the time. And polarizer is situation dependent. But if I'm somewhere like a, any kind of foliage situation, that's going to be on my lens 100% of the time. Um, a lot of times, uh, polarizer will cut down on reflections. So you may be in a scene where you don't want a reflection as much. Uh, polarizer will also work only at certain degrees. So you can't use a polarizer if you're staring directly at the sun. Um, but a polarizer, uh, what it will also do is wipe off. The reason it's so good for foliage is it, it really just tones down any reflections, any light that's coming on the leaves. So if there's any water or, or light on the leaves, that would normally take away from the vibrancy of the leaves. But by putting that polarizer on there, you just uh, kind of wipe that away. Uh, same thing with water. If you ever want to see what's in the water below you, so if you know if you're at a beach and there's nice sand under the water, or if you're in a, a pond and there's nice colored pebbles or something in the water, if you have a polarizer, you can cut down the glare. Uh, that comes on that water and you can see that water's bottom surface um, you know which really can can be dramatically different looking than if you have a polar uh, not a polarizer on uh, so shooting around water um, shooting foliage those are two times I'm you know gonna have a polarizer on most of the time I would say uh, the, thank you for that question on the ND filters do you have one that you gravitate more to than others um, I have uh, a three stop a six stop and a ten stop um, and I, I typically use the six stop, I would say most, and I think a lot of people don't necessarily agree to that, but I, I often find I will start out, I, I'll usually get to the location, I'm usually uh, often shooting a sunrise or sunset. Um, and so let's say if I come onto a scene for sunrise, I'll usually start without a filter, uh, because my exposure time will be long already because there's not much light there. So I may already be looking at 10, 20, 30 second exposures with no filter. Um, so I won't put a filter on in that case. Uh, and then I, um, 
will, from that point, I will, uh, you know, add add filters as the light kind of comes up more. So if I want to stay around that, you know, five second or 10 second range, I'll, I'll use a filter in order to, to do that. Um, and so often that will be, a, you know, putting on a six stop when it gets a little brighter. Um, so the 10 stop to me is more like a creative filter when you really want to extend that exposure time and really want to drag that shutter. Uh, that's when I might use a, a 10 stop, but that more becomes a creative decision rather than something I would do regularly. Uh, and the three stop for me is very rare. The only time I really use the three stop is when I'm trying to control water flow. Um, like I mentioned at the beach or the waterfall, when I really want, I know when I want that to be like a half second or two second kind of exposure. And my readings give me something totally different than I would try to use the three stop really in a control situation. Um, so that's my least used. Uh, I just find it doesn't have that much of a dramatic impact um, on the scene itself. It really just uh, tweaks it. So it's uh, something I'll use when I just want a little more control on the situation. So hopefully that helps answer your question. Thank you. So Mike had a question in chat. I'd be interested in seeing an original capture of the final image with your thoughts on processing. Okay. Uh, yeah, processing to me is, you know, it's an important factor. Uh, you know, it, it really, uh, you know, uh, you can do things in the field to lessen what you need to process. So a, a lot of it does come down to how comfortable you are processing. And it takes a while to learn things like exposure blending and, and do it perfectly, you know, do it flawlessly. Uh, to, to blend different exposures. And if you don't do it, it's a lot easier to, uh, you know, if you're not good at it, you're better off trying to get it in one exposure in the field. Um, but once you can kind of learn how to do it well, you can get more comfortable with taking multiple exposures, you know, in the field um, that you know when you get it back on, on screen, you can, you can blend those and, and have a natural looking result. Um, so I, I think it makes your job a little easier. It gives you a little more cushion if you can learn that in terms of exposure blending. Um, but in terms of uh, what I try to do when processing, um, I'm trying to bring up something, but I, I always try to look at something and I decide where I want to take the photo. So that's one of the first things I try to try to think. So I always try to visualize in my head where I'd like the end product to be before I even edit. So I'm trying to always edit with a goal in mind, whether it's you know to bring the viewer's attention to a certain area, uh, so I say to myself, okay, I know I need to you know at some point dodge and burn this area to to bring out something and and not take their attention from somewhere else. I know I want to tone down this other area, so I kind of really critically analyzing it right in the beginning and trying to decide where I want to take the photo. Um, there's not many steps I do exactly the same on every photo. I really think that each edit is is it, its own. Uh, you know, I see a lot of things like presets being sold, like Lightroom presets. And I, I really think that's, uh, you know, something that people buy in the beginning thinking it's going to transform their photography if they use someone else's preset. And I, I really think it's not the right way to do it. You know, you really have to see what these sliders are doing um, and, and really, you know, have a better understanding because every photo you, you really need to treat differently. Some photos I would edit completely different than others. There isn't really a time when I would apply a global preset across 10 different photos and have it all be, be the same, taken at you know, 10 different shots, uh, 10 different locations. Um, so um, I can try to see if I can find something in my Lightroom library, but it might take me a minute. Uh, so on the right here is my, is my edits that I did. And uh, so this was the DNG file. I had done some Lightroom edits here, um, but otherwise, uh, you know, this was at a camera plus Lightroom edits. And then this was after Photoshop editing here on the left uh, hand side. So you can see I, I clearly darkened a lot of areas that I didn't want people's attention to look at. So this rock here, on the left, I did a lot of burning here. So you kind of wouldn't look here. I did a lot of burning on, on really all the rocks. I wanted the light to kind of come a little more from the background um, and kind of draw your eye into the photo rather than have the attention be right at the waterfall. Obviously the waterfall is the subject, but I wanted the light to be uh, you know, an important element here kind of coming from the back. And I wanted the viewer's eye to go throughout the whole scene 
and not just stare right at the bright water and have that be their only uh, attention point. Um, so that meant a lot of darkening of, of areas, again, that weren't as visually appealing. It definitely brought out some of that foliage color. And you can see that in the background here. Um, these are, uh, you know, more vibrant. Um, I, you know, I tried to stay natural with it, uh, not go, you know, out of the, out of the realm. Um, of reasonable, but try to bring out that foliage a little more, so bring out the foliage color. So I, I think I did that here in the background. Um, this was kind of a hot spot, so I had to control this area, bring down the highlights in that section a little bit. So I think an exposure blended a little there to make that work. Um, I may even have filled in, in one or two spots just to kind of make it a little more enclosed looking. Um, and. Uh, yeah, so that's kind of, you know, gives you an idea of what I would do. I definitely went in here and brought in a lot of attention to this water. If you can look at it, it's kind of subtle, but I, I added some of this, um, you know, some more spray here, if you look. So I, so I did that by brushing on the water um, with a, just a, a feathered brush to add a little, just a little soft, soft light. Um, to, to that area that kind of bring in, you could also use like a, you know, the opposite of a dehaze slider. So the dehaze slider, but in the other direction um, in order to get that kind of hazy look, uh, just added, added what was already there. So it was already there, it was present, um, but I brought a little more emphasis on that. I added, added that a little more, brought that a little more. Um, and I did that throughout the water as it's kind of cascading down. It's a little tough uh, to see if you don't look at it. I brought a little bit of blue into the water too. Sometimes I like, uh, to put just a touch of blue in water. I don't ever want water to look warm. Um, I think blue water tends to look cleaner. So it's something that you don't necessarily look at it immediately and say, wow, that water's blue. Um, but if you add just a, a little touch to, you know, a, a stream or a lake or a pond uh, of a blue tone, um, I think it can look like cleaner, uh, cleaner water, um, which, which I definitely did here uh, comparing the two. So that's a big change is the water definitely has more blue added. Um, which isn't in, in the rest of the scene. So that's just selectively to, to the water parts. Um, so again, that's part of what I was talking about where selective editing versus global editing. Um, so anyway, I, I hope that's helpful. Um, kind of shows you the a before and after. Um, again, there's some, you know, some elements here where I added just, you know, I brightened up certain areas here where I want the viewer's eye to go. Um, and, and then really you know, darkening here because I don't want people's eye to really look at the edges. So you, know, you can vignette and do that, but if you vignette, you don't have control if there's an area like here, for example, where I don't want to darken. You know, I want people to see this waterfall tailing off to the edge, so I don't want to darken here. Uh, so I wouldn't want to do a vignette on this photo, and I wouldn't want to darken here. Um, so I would want to, instead of vignetting, kind of selectively darken and lighten as I, as I can um, throughout. Uh, okay. Ken wanted to know about the slow shutter speed. Shutter speed on that was one second. That was one second. So I really find that one second, um, it really depends on, on the speed of the water. So it's a little tough to ever give one number and say it's going to always have the same effect because the, this, the speed of the waves coming in or the speed of water rushing in a case of a waterfall is going to be a little different at every location. Uh, and even at the same location, it's going to matter on the water flow. Um, but typically anywhere from 0.5 seconds to two seconds is usually my preferred range. What I find that gives you is it gives you lines in the water. So it shows movement, but it smooths it out. So it's not the same as you know, capture a wave in motion crashing might be like, you know, one five hundredth of a second. You'd have to shoot that really fast, almost like a bird in flight, you know, to, to freeze that wave when it's cresting. Um, but I, I generally, you know, don't try to do that uh, with a nature scene uh, unless I was shooting away for that purpose. Um, and, and so I find that kind of middle ground area I really prefer. If I were to take a 30 second exposure in that same location, the water would be really completely smoothed out. You wouldn't see that same movement in the water. So it, it's really kind of a balance of finding that middle ground for me at least. And other people may prefer totally smooth out water or, or for it to look more like it does in person. So really in person, it, it, you know, a two second exposure may not look as, as natural to people um, because in person we're not seeing, a, a, you know, we're not putting our eyes on the scene for two seconds. But, you know, I like to try to, 
put a little bit of creative touch to the, you know, to the scene and to the photo. Uh, so that, that, to answer the question, that was a one second exposure on that waterfall. Great, thank you. Matt, how do you get to travel to all these exotic places that you go to? <laughs> oh, I know, well, I haven't done that this year, uh, Carol, but, but yeah, I mean, travel is, is really kind of, I caught that bug, you know, if you will. Um, and so it's, it's not always easy, but I, you know, just, uh, I've been very fortunate to be able to, to travel some of these exotic locations. Uh, and, and this year I, I've really missed that aspect of it, haven't been able to travel anywhere. Um, but, but yeah, travel for me is, is just some, something I'm very passionate, something I love to do. Uh, so I do try to save up uh, to, to be able to travel and I've been very fortunate to be able to do that. And I often like to, you know, we try to bring the family with us and go and make a family trip and on just off at, you know, off at sunrise and off at sunset and doing the regular tourist thing during the day when we can. Other times I take uh, solo trips just for photos, but um, you know, it's, uh, it's been very nice to be able to travel. I don't think you need to travel, but it's just something in order to take, you know, nice landscape photos, but it's, it's something that I, uh, I just really enjoy. I kind of caught that travel bug and um, really enjoy getting out to different places and, and seeing them, so. You go with photo groups? Uh, I have not. I, I've always gone just, just solo. Um, you know, I have, uh, I haven't done any of the workshops. Um, I think there would be definite learning potential and definite interest in doing those. I have, honestly, the prices I've seen are, are usually pretty high. I mean, it makes sense. The workshop provider has to, not in terms of the day workshops, but the ones that are like trips, uh, where it's like spend a whole week in some exotic location. Um, you know, they have to provide insurance. They have to pay for multiple instructors, and, you know, and everything else. There's so many costs involved that it really just brings up your cost as the traveler so much higher. Um, I think certain people would feel more comfortable in groups. I've been in some dicey situations by myself um, that uh, I'd feel a lot better if I had someone next to me. Um, I think that's something that kind of favors, uh, you know, a male photographer as well. I think as a female photographer, I might not be as comfortable, uh, you know, going out alone for a Milky Way shot in some exotic location that you've never been to before, heading out, you know, on your own at midnight in some pl strange place. Uh, so, yeah, so I, I think there is a lot of benefit in going in groups, but, you know, I think, uh, you know, mainly what would even be better is like you guys are already a, a group here, you know, uh, uh, collaborate and get together, you know, if a few of you go out together. Um, I've done things like that locally, obviously, um, or gone out with friends and I've I've met people on location that I know from, from other places, uh, social media, and we've connected in lo on location. So I was in the Lofoten Islands uh, in Norway, for example, I was by myself, but I was able to connect with a couple of people that I had known on social media who were there at the same time. And then we went out and photographed together and we did the Northern Lights kind of tours together, um, just out, out on our own. But uh, it made it a lot safer, especially going on icy rocks in the you know Arctic Circle in, in the winter. Uh, wouldn't have been very safe completely on my own. So it was nice to have them with it. Uh, what camera? Uh, what camera brand system are you using? So yeah, I am using mirrorless. I'm, I'm using a Sony uh, Sony system. Um, so I've been shooting Sony for quite some time. Um, I've been on Sony for at least seven years. Uh, the Sony mirrorless. So I started out with. Uh, an RX1, which is was a fixed lens, 35 millimeter. You couldn't change, couldn't change it, but a beautiful Zeiss lens that was paired with it. Uh, so a fixed, not interchangeable lens. Um, and then once the A7R came out, the very first one, I got the A7R. Um, and now I, I stayed with that A7R, the, the latest, you know, the more recent version of it, but I uh, stayed with that uh, Sony system with the A7R uh, system. And, um, and uh, you know, the, Originally, when mirrorless came out, uh, there were limited lens options. Um, you kind of had to work around that. Um, and now, now that's not the case. And then Canon and Nikon have gone mirrorless. And uh, I know a lot of people have switched over from, from the Canon and Nikon system to the mirrorless. I think there's a lot of benefits with the focus peaking, make it a lot easier to focus, uh, seeing that kind of real time, what you're going to get out of the camera. Um, I've, I don't really know much beyond mirrorless, to be honest. I used to have a Nikon. Um, 
D3100 or something before, well, before I even started with Sony, it dates back a little while. Um, and uh, that's kind of all, only knowledge I have of, of the DLSR system without mirrorless. So, so I've kind of been on the mirrorless bandwagon for, for a long, long time um, and definitely a proponent of it. So and I'm happy to see the other brands have are catching on. Uh, there's a lot of benefits. Uh, you can make the lenses smaller in a lot of cases too. Um, it's been some amazing lenses that come out lately for the mirrorless system. I, I have a question if I may. Um, sure. Thank mm -hmm. you so much, Matt. This is just a, such a wonderful presentation and it was really helpful to hear your critique and, uh, and to see some of your amazing work. And given all these places that you go, I, I'm just thinking, how do you do these shutter speeds in terms of, you know, using uh, tripods? Like, do you have a particular brand or do you use the single pole? I'm just wondering how you approach it. I use it. a tripod pretty much. Maybe I can grab my tripod real quick. Ooh, show <laughs> and tell. Excellent. <laughs> I do have a, I do have a, a really good tripod. So this is a really right stuff tripod. Um, I started out with this the third tripod I went I've gone through, um, and what I found is similar to what I was describing the filters when when you have the and this is a really tall tripod. So um, I'm a pretty tall guy. I'm six four, and this goes taller than me. So if I extend this, I can get this up to about seven feet where the, where the camera is if I fully extend the lights. Um, and other tripods I've had in the past um, were shorter and I occasionally ran into limitations where I was like at a fence or, or some sort of viewpoint where I wanted to be higher and I, and I couldn't get there with the tripod I had. Um, this one I'm always nervous about with travel, but I haven't had any issues and I say nervous by it's too big to fit in any kind of bag. So I'm always, you know, trying to strap it um, onto a carry-on bag and hope that the airplane police don't, you know, say you can't do that. I have spikes on the bottom, of the these are removable. So I take these spikes off and I put these in my bag. I find these spikes really useful on like beaches or even rocks, gives me really good grip. So if I, if I put this in the sand and a wave comes, this thing's not moving. Um, you know, this is a really good quality tripod. I have a leveling base as well, uh, which I'll use for pano, uh, pano photos. So I can level this and then just um, then I'll have a level head so I can move the camera around and I don't have to worry about any parallax errors um, or anything else. Um, and uh, I prefer these kind of clip things rather than the screw on for, for the tripod head. Uh, I use the tripod almost all the time. Um, it's just kind of, I, I often do long exposures and filters, so somewhat can be somewhat of a necessity. So, um, so yeah, I, I, tripods are important. Part of my travel can be heavy when hiking or things like that with the tripod, but try to just work around it and consider it kind of an essential piece of equipment that I have to bring wherever I'm going, <laughs> some way or somehow. Uh, and if I'm checking a bag, I'll often um, put my tripod in a check bag. I'll take off, uh, no matter what, I'll take off the head. So the head's kind of more fragile part. So I'll take off the head and put that in my carry-on and then I'll either try to get away with strapping the legs onto a bag uh, on my carry-on or, or pack it in a check bag. So I haven't run any, any issues yet, but it's a concern of mine every time. As is the weight, you know, when, when you travel with uh, a few lenses and a camera, you're easily over the whatever, eight kilograms or whatever. I don't even know what it equates to <laughs> uh, in pounds, but you know, the check-in bag is always overweight. So you're just praying that they don't weigh you and give you a hard time and tell you you got to check it. Because as a photographer, when you're carrying, uh, you know, a nice camera and lenses that are fragile, you don't want that going through the uh, checked carry check system on the airplane. So it's a concern. Uh, I haven't traveled at all this year. And I know I've heard this year that I really haven't even been allowing their hands. They're just checking everything and not charging you for checking. But that wouldn't even work for me. I'd be so paranoid that the thing would come up broken on the other side. So, thank you. Oh, uh, and I don't think I—I I don't know if I touched on or explained before um, my previous tripods. So I—I I started out. I had uh, a couple other previous tripods that were, you know, inexpensive tripods. And I often say with tripods, you're you're going to end up paying in the long run. So you know, you should probably just start out with a good one because if you don't. Um, I had kind of the cheaper 
tripods, you know, hundred hundred fifty dollar tripods before, um, and they work fine. They work fine for you know a half dozen times, and then things start just happening. You know, you just go out and the leg all of a sudden doesn't lock in quite right. Uh, you know, and it's really something that over time just the build quality shows through. So it's not. You go out in one shoot, you could have a cheap tripod, you could have the best tripod on the market, you're gonna get the same experience. It really isn't gonna make a difference then. It's more the over time, the more times you go out, you just reliability is really what you're paying for with a better tripod. Sometimes you can get a little taller or some other features, but for the most part, it's more of a reliability issue where you, you know, just not gonna have that issue. You can get sea salt on it and not really worry about it, wipe it off with the cloth and you're fine versus a small one, uh, you know, cheap one. Uh, you know, some sea salt is going to deteriorate and just ruin that tripod and you're done. So, hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Sure. All right. Well, thank you so much, Matt, for yeah. all your information all right. and your judging time. It was amazing hearing you go over how you work on the photos. Great. Thank you. Great. Great. Glad, uh, glad you guys enjoyed it. I know, but I don't know if you can see that. Just can we actually it. get his um, website, Matt? Do I, do I have my website? Can we, can uh, we get your website address? Is it just your name or? Yeah, uh, it's my name and photography. So. Yeah, I, I think I sent it to everyone and it's also linked to from the um, Anything Goes page. But yes, yeah. uh, you've got it here too. I, I just put it in the chat. So yeah, so it's just my name, Matt Reynolds um, and photography.com. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Matt. Thank you again for everything, Matt. You are a wealth of knowledge. It's very Thank clear. You. And your critiquing was fabulous. Spot on, I think. Thank you. So Thank you. you. Yeah. yeah, I really enjoyed it. I appreciate you inviting me into the, to the group here to, you know, to be the judge. And it was a very rewarding experience for myself as well. So hopefully I was able to give something back. For well, it was wonderful. Thank you very much. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Right. Well, have a good Hopefully weekend, we'll everyone. See you at Grafton. Yep. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Thanks, Lisa. All right. Have a good weekend, everyone. Thanks so much for organizing. Yep. Thanks. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa.